So I'm here today with uh, my good friend Brian Cunningham, uh, former uh, CIA officer, a White House lawyer, and uh, uh, a fan of history. We're here to talk about the world going to shit, Brian. I think that's the proper way to define it. Would you agree with that definition? Well, let me just say, I thank you for having me, Tom. I've been listening a lot to uh, uh, REM, and the way I, su I sum it up is, uh, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Yeah. Um, so speaking about the end of the world, uh, as you know, as everybody here know, um, uh, Alexei Navalny, who, who was uh, the main oppositioner for Putin, the only opposition for Putin, I, I guess, in the last uh, couple of decades, um, uh, suddenly died, let's put it this way, in the Russian prison. So uh, can you tell us, I mean, you work for the CIA for, for a long time, you work for the How White House for a long time. Can you tell us about this guy? I mean, uh, is he being romanticized by the Western media or he's, is he... Was he an actual hope? What's the deal with the Navalny? Well, Tom, I'm old enough to remember I was an analyst of the Soviet KGB when they uh, stabbed Georgi Markov, a Bulgarian dissident, on a bridge with an umbrella and poisoned him to death. And so this has a long history. I don't think we'll probably ever know what the exact final cause of death was for Navalny, but for sure it's on Putin, regardless of what happened. Do I think he was a potential, uh, you know, savior of Russia? Look, human beings are all flawed. I am, you are. I'm sure there's some skeletons in his closet. I'm sure he had some issues. But one, he was an absolute unmitigated hero. Uh, I think of John McCain, uh, our senator who was shot down during Vietnam and was held in a Vietnamese prison camp and tortured. And he was invited to be released at any time because his father was an admiral in the Navy and it would have been great propaganda. And he refused to leave until all of his comrades could come out with him. And this is sort of how I think of Navalny, right? The guy gets poisoned, almost dies, could have stayed relatively safe in the West and enhanced his security. And then he goes back to face what had to have been certain death. And of course, now we know he was. And Bad things seem to keep happening to Putin's opponents. I don't know how many have uh, gone out of a hospital window recently, but pretty much all of them, including the guy, remember, who the they conveniently the bus drove by and stopped and blocking the camera, and then the guy turned up shot in the head afterwards. So very, very sad and tragic, but also not surprising for Putin. Yeah, we have uh, Nemtsov. There were plenty of examples. Uh, a few failed ones. You remember the guy with his daughter back in the UK? Yeah. So on the bench, the park bench with and the thing is, Putin doesn't even try to disguise it, right? He no. uses for his overseas poisonings, he no. likes to use a chemical weapon that really only comes from one place. I think he he wants to give off this uh, Tony Soprano vibe. Yeah. Like he he wants people to know he did it. In a way, yeah, I'm sure it was no coincidence that Navalny died on the same day that the Munich Security Conference started. The crazy part about it, he was on camera, uh, kidding around with the with that uh, federal judge, just uh, what 24 hours before he suddenly died. Yeah, which I, I also don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's because Putin wanted the world to know that he did not die of natural causes. Yeah, he looked healthy. He looked fine. Yeah. As healthy as you can be in a polar gulag. I mean, this guy's literally in the place, uh, one of the types of places that the gulag archipelago was written about, what, 60 years ago? And yeah. that wasn't enough for Putin. He had to die and he had to have the world know he died. Peter wow. Zehan, I don't know if you follow his work, but uh, Peter Zehan said, and I agree with him 100%, he said that uh, the Siberian gulag, uh, by the way, in Russian it said gulag, gulag. Not gulag. You guys pronounce okay. it correct, incorrectly. Ah, okay. But the but the Siberian gulag, and I'm going to use the American way of saying it, is where uh, the Russians send people who they want gone. Yeah. So you get sent there to either die, or just to disappear, or to not even come back as the same person. So nobody really survives. Yeah, I don't yeah. think people understand how harsh of a conditions they've got over there. Well, it's a death camp. Yeah, it's a death camp, 100%. Yeah. But again, 
But that's how diabolical Putin is. That wasn't good enough for him with Navalny. Le leaving him to rot there for the rest of his life in those horrible conditions wasn't good enough. He had to But isn't him. he... I want to challenge you here a little bit because I know you can take it. So right. you've seen David Sachs' tweets? Uh, Cam, I haven't focused on so him. So David but... Sachs, the guy from all the All In podcast. Yeah. So he has a series of tweets uh, over the past 24 hours basically saying, look, I'm not a pro Putin chill, uh, but I don't see what Putin has to gain from uh, knocking out Navalny in this particular juncture. I mean, uh, the, why would he do that and basically reignite the Russian opposition and piss them off and, and send the uh, shockwaves around the world? Why would he do that when the U.S. is uh, basically on the fence about keeping financing Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So he was basically alluding to the fact that it was not perhaps it was not put. No, I, I totally disagree with that. Uh, first of all, I don't believe. Any... I'm going to try and find the tweet for you. Hold on. So maybe I've right. butchered it. Well, let me just say two things about it. One is I don't believe any foreign intelligence service could make their way to that gulag gulag and break in and kill someone without Putin's security forces knowing. That's number one. Number two, I think the motivation... That's a good point. That's a good point. I think the motivation... I mean, how many thousands of kilometers is that from any train, any airport, any you know public transportation? No, but, even from inside Russia, it's a, it's a two or three day trip from right. inside Russia. Right. So there's that. Then on top of that, more importantly, I think the motivation is quite clear. I think he did it. He announced it to the world as the Munich Security Conference was happening because he thinks he's already got America on our heels with our ridiculous House of Representatives delaying aid. But now he sees the Europeans stepping up to fill the void and he wants to tell the Europeans, I will do whatever I want to do and you guys better not help uh, my enemies. So this is the tweet in question. So I, I, I butchered it a little bit, but I got the gist of it correctly. So he says, why would Putin do this now at the worst time for himself and best time for neocons seeking to gen i think you can see where he stands on the political map seeking yeah. to generate the moral outrage in favor of ukraine funding he could have just waited you don't have to believe putin is a good to ask this question only that he's strategic so basically well, i think they you're talking about capabilities right the capability is like not there how I, would you I, yeah so first of all let me you know just full disclosure if people don't already know i guess I was Condi Rice's lawyer in the White House, so I guess I'm one of those neocons, so people can factor that in. But more importantly, I know how the Russian services operate, and I understand motivation. And I don't think Putin believes, especially with Navalny dead, that he has any significant internal opposition, and he believes whatever there is is going to be scared off by Navalny getting killed. And more importantly, like I said, I think he's sending a message to the Europeans to back off on their help to Ukraine. It's just like, Tom, it's just like, remember early in the war when Putin ordered his tanks to fire on that nuclear power plant, literally fire live rounds at a nuclear power plant in Ukraine? At the time, I said, and I still believe, that was Putin's way of trying to tell the world, I will do whatever the hell I want. I'm crazy. Don't mess with me. I think this is the same thing. Uh, I remember... Uh... Putin apologists were telling us that this is a false flag attack, but the Ukrainians are trying to uh, put the blame on Putin. It's pretty difficult to fake a Russian tank shooting live rounds at a power plant. Yeah. I want to show you, just for reference, uh, what the uh, gulag that he was in uh, looks like. Just oh, yeah. a little taste. Yeah, it's, it's pretty... It's as close as, as you can to get to uh, like Alcatraz. So this is I'm the sure, I'm sure the conditions are much worse than Alcatraz. So this is the it's in the I middle know. of nowhere. It's harsh weather. Uh, there's really no place to go. You know, back in the day, uh, so S Siberian gulags is not anything new, right? So it's it's an it's uh, it's an old system. So back in the day, um, crazy story. So in the gulags, they would not even, uh, the prisoners, they could go into town and come back to get groceries or if the wife came for a visit, so they have like a conjugal visit, so he'll go, he'll come back because there's nobody to run. There's nowhere to run. There's no point. There's n You can't go anywhere. You're surrounded by snow 
elements and there's no civilization anywhere. So well, I, yeah, I was going to say, was gonna say it doesn't actually even look that heavily fortified, which is to your point. They the inmates know that there's no point in trying to. Escape. There's no way to go. You'll die. You'll die yeah. outside. There's yeah. there's just you won't survive. So they won't even come to pick up. The, uh, there's a very famous Russian movie where the, the guy, the wife comes to visit the guy. Uh, so basically the, the movie, uh, you love uh, Russian cinema, so you love this. So a guy uh, is basically on the train, okay? Yeah. And then uh, he, he gets off the train and then uh, some guy walks up to him and says, hey, look, look can you watch these, uh, these few, uh, few, few bags for me? And then uh, he rushes on the train and he forgets his bags and the guy's miss, missing his own train because he left with other dudes' bags. Yeah. And he gets stuck in this train station. So he meets a lady who works as a waitress in this train station and they fall in love. And she finds out that he's married, but uh, he's going to prison because his wife, who's a famous uh, TV presenter, she killed the guy because she was driving drunk and he took the fall for her and he's going to prison. So they fall in love. Eventually, he gets divorced. But the final scene is uh, she comes to visit him in the gulag, and then uh, he's late because they sleep in, and he's late. So he's running back, and she's running with him to try. So, so he's trying to make it back on time. They wouldn't even come to pick this motherfucker up because it, like, it's your yeah. responsibility to come. It's like you can't go anywhere. Yeah, no Uber um, at the gulag. No. So uh, a little bit more on the serious note, uh, Brian. So coming back to your kind of uh, geopolitical analytical skills, you know, former White House, uh, former CIA, what would Russia look like uh, if Navalny uh, was successful, if his movement would have worked like it did in Ukraine and other places? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're probably more qualified to answer that than I am. I, I did spend, uh, interestingly enough, I did not spend any time in Russia proper when I was in the government. But I did spend some time in Russia after uh, the wall fell, after Gorbachev was gone, somewhere in between Yeltsin and Putin becoming the dictator that he is today. And uh, it was, uh, you know, in Moscow, this was in the mid 2000s, uh, in Moscow, it, it felt very westernized, um, very prosperous. Now, of course, we all knew that you get three kilometers outside of Moscow and it's still you know, poverty. But in the city, it, it, it really was quite westernized. I Even as an ex-CIA officer, I felt safe. I'm sure I was surveilled, but I didn't feel in any danger. And then, uh, and, and, and I'd be curious on your take, my sense is that the Russian people had been so completely subverted and kept down and not had any choices really in life for so long that when they really suddenly had all these choices, they a certain percentage of the population kind of didn't really know what to do with their freedom. Organized crime came out from its holes and became public, you know, crime. The country became a more of a kleptocracy, and people said, "Oh, we just need a strong man to protect us." So, what well, the reason I say that whole long story is, you know, there's a corner case where even if Navalny had sparked a revolution and been successful and Putin got overthrown and put on the ash heap of history, if Navalny had tried to bring, you know, democracy and full free economy in too quickly, same thing might have happened again. But I don't know. I'd be curious to get your take. Yeah, Russia doesn't fit with democracy. It doesn't work there. You can't, you can't do it. Uh, it's been rooted out. The people who... Uh, who live there have been systematically bred to to kill any sort of uh, independent thinking, intellectualism, yeah. uh, freedom of speech. All these things have been essentially systematically kind of almost like you breed cattle in a sort of way. They've been yeah. bred out. So, and I'm talking back since the 1917 onwards. Right. Oh, so yeah. it's been a hundred years of basically killing any sort of uh, liberal movement. So they exist in Russia. But they exist on the fringe. I think that if uh, the 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 system uh, as a democracy existed for you know for for a good let's say at least a decade and a half, two thousand five, yeah. right? It, people were missing uh, communism, like uh, old old babushkas yeah, in, in exactly. Russia 
were talking about how good things were back in the communist days when yeah. I, when, when I was uh, asking this question. So, I mean, I, I hate to say never, but given Putin's behavior in the last five years, it's hard to believe that somebody worse would come to power. So you'd have to hope Navalny would have been better. But the question becomes, would he have been able to move the country in his image or would the country have moved him in Putin's image, right? And, you know, what are you going to do once you're in power to stay in mm -hmm. power? I want to change gears with you, stay on Putin, but change perspectives, if that's okay. Yeah. So, uh, number one, look at this handsome man who used to be young and thin before he got fat and old. <laughs> hey, Tom, you know how many Wolverines have ever been sighted in the state of Michigan? Uh, I've, I've, I've lived there and I haven't seen a single one. Yeah. None. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's revisionist history. That so is a good man, though. Uh, thank you, sir. So I've posted this poll in the, in the, in the head in advance for our uh, uh, chat today. Now I can't find it. Okay, here's the poll. So I posted this poll, and the reason I posted this poll is because I've noticed a very interesting phenomenon. So I've noticed uh, that people in America, whether they're left, whether they're right, generally have very favorable uh, approach or opinion or sentiment towards Vladimir Putin. Uh, and I, I have a theory why. So this was a question about Tucker Carlson, but what I was really asking is is the Putin question. But uh, I just wanted to see uh, if people can see through the bullshit. And if, if you, you can see, you know, uh, half of the 2,000 people who answered this poll, half of them said that Tucker was objective, which means, you know, they liked the interview. It's yeah. I, I kind of conned them a little bit, but it's okay. Uh, so, my right. theory, and I want to run this by you, and I, I know, look, I know which side on the political map you are. Uh, we are uh, uh, opposing sides, uh, but uh, I respect your opinion a lot. Uh, again, in my opinion, and I'm not taking a side right now in American politics, I'm just saying, I th I can't stand Putin. I th We'll talk about that interview in a second and what a yeah. horror shit show it was. Yeah. The reason I think that people can't see through the Russian PSYOP that was this interview and many other things, they can't see through the Putin BS and the Tucker Carlson BS, is I think they yearn for somebody who can actually talk and who is uh, coherent and who is able to articulate himself and project strength, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And because they don't have it right now, and I, I, with all due respect to President Biden, you know, he's he's past this prime, obviously, Absolutely. right? <clears throat> so I think because people, like, they look at their leader and say, well, this guy can really talk and he's charismatic and, and he's strong and he's... So I think that clouds their judgment a little bit about what this motherfucker really is. But I'm curious to see your take about why half of America genuinely uh, 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 writes this motherfucker's dick. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for helping me popularize the phrase useful idiot. As, uh, as I'm sure I stole it from you, by the way. Yeah, well, I stole it from the KGB. So th there you go. Hey. But but I think it's important to just unpack that a second for, for our viewers, because um, it, it sounds like it's an insult to someone's intelligence. And it can be. But what it really means, it's an actual Soviet KGB term, useful idiot, which is distinguished between what you're calling here a Russian shill, a, a fully, you know, a fully intelligence operative who's recruited by Russia to do their business, either being paid or blackmailed or for whatever reason, and a useful idiot who is pushing Russian propaganda for their own purposes or or unknowingly. And I would actually, um, well, first of all, it's good that uh, pleasant surprise, fifty three percent think he's either a Russian shill or a useful idiot. So yep. that's better than I thought it would turn out. Um, no, I, I knew it's going to be fifty fifty because I've seen ha my comment section. OK, I, so I, I think I think there's probably something to your theory um, that people are just sort of drawn to what they view as strength and clarity. But I think it's I think it's much more um, that. And by the way, I'm not sure you know my politics as well as you think. I happen to be at this moment in history extremely, as you know, anti-Trump, because I think one yep. he is in Putin's pocket and two, he wants to be a dictator. But. You know, I work for George W. Bush and Condi Rice and Ronald Reagan. So I view myself as a kind of militant centrist more than partisan one way or the other. And I've said many times Biden 
doesn't have all of his cognitive functions. He should have stepped down, not stepped down from the presidency, but announced he wasn't going to run yep. and let someone younger do it. But I'm not sure Trump is a whole lot very far behind him in that. But anyway, to your point, I think it's partly what you say. It's also two other phenomena that are incredibly disturbing to me. I'm sure you've seen it. One, especially I would say for people under 40 years old uh, who never really saw the real Cold War and don't understand what communism was like if you ever had to actually live under it. Uh, they think of communism as, you know, Grandpa Bernie Sanders, nice old guy that wants to forgive my student loans. Yeah. So, so so I think that's part of it. And, you know, they say, oh, Putin's a socialist. It must be a good country. And then you got Tucker driving around with a, a grocery cart. But I think the bigger problem that, that is, was that was so cringe. I know. I know. That was I very think, cringe. I think the bigger problem is that there is at least two to three generations now of Americans and I would say Westerners <clears throat> who have just been indoctrinated in university to believe this colonialism, decolonialism propaganda that Putin pushes, but more importantly, to just not think critically at all. So you've seen uh, all of a sudden Osama bin Laden became very popular, like he was an international resistance hero. All of a sudden, well, he, he, he became viral on TikTok. Yeah, well, yeah, and then all of a sudden the Jews did 9/11, which of course is total bullshit. And then now you have Putin being popular, and I think it's because um, there's a lot of people now. Sorry about the phone, who just believe that there's no such thing as objective facts in history. So they think Putin sounds good. Fine, go with it. Also, though, I think you have to admit that a huge percentage of people who believe that Putin is objective and Tucker's objective are just doing it because that's what Donald Trump tells them. I mean, that's that's how indoctrinated I think his not everyone who supports Putin, but his hardcore mega base. Putin likes uh, or Trump likes Putin. Therefore, we like Putin. Trump likes uh, Erdogan. Therefore, we like Erdogan. I don't think it's that much more complicated. I think that uh, we we are due uh, some sort of a rebuttal uh, about the interview. And I, there's no better person to do that than you, in my opinion. Now, we're not going to obviously talk about Catherine the Great from the 11th century, which was a complete... Uh, as an interviewer, for him to allow that, he either had to fear for his life, Completely had no knowledge of that history, even though he's a history uh, uh, major, right? Or uh, he was shilling. There's no way that you let him go on a 35-minute tirade about letters sent by Ivan the Great to Katharina the Great in the 11th century and what they had for lunch. That was a complete uh, joke. That part of the interview was just... I, I couldn't believe what I was saying, but uh, can well, you talk a little other, bit... There's a reason why... Dozens of credible, hard-hitting Western journalists like Chris Wallace have tried to get... Yeah, more and he rejected them. And yeah. he won't do it because he yeah. wanted a chill. No, he wanted it. And then, by the way, Putin was on Russian media the day after the interview. You guys don't know this on the West because you don't watch Russian media, but I watch Russian media. Not RT, the actual Russian media. Yeah. Okay, Channel One and all of them. Um, so he was on Russian media the day after. And he was basically parading from studio to studio saying, Tucker Carlson, he's such an asshole. I expected him to ask me hard questions so I could fuck him, but he didn't. And he did it because he knew I would destroy him and completely fucked up my tactic. He's such a piece of shit. I'm so angry. The interview didn't go like I wanted to. Like he was spinning this whole <laughs> lack of hard hating question as if it backfired on, against him. And that Tucker Carlson is such an enemy. Like, come, it's like, <laughs> oh, and. People are lapping it up. So he's, can, can, he's, can, you imagine, can you imagine being such a shill and such a shitty journalist that Vladimir Putin is complaining that you didn't ask him hard hitting enough questions? Yeah, he was saying, "Yo, I wish you would ask me some more hard hitting questions because I wanted to destroy him, but he never gave me the chance." And he's brilliant for doing that. That was he's literally I verbatim quote him on. on, yeah. on uh, uh, so well, it, all, yeah. it, also, it also shows you uh, how KGB officers feel about their friends. They don't stay friends very long. Well, first of all, he insulted Tucker Carlson a lot during the interview, and he, he pushed him around and was very disrespectful. But that's uh, not, not not my business. Uh, what I wanted to say, look, I would love, by the way, not even a hard-hitting journalist, just uh, Pierce Morgan would have been fine. 
You know, Tom, who did the best interview I've ever seen with Edward Snowden? It was it was uh, John Oliver. Mm. And John Oliver went to Moscow, made a big show out of it. It's pretty amusing, too, if you can find it. Interviewed Snowden, the first quote unquote journalist ever to ask Edward Snowden in public, hey, about those millions of pages that you took of classified documents to China and Russia, did you read those? And of course he didn't. He never he'd never stoned him and never read him. But no one else had ever asked him that question in public. Yep. John Oliver is uh, it's a different topic. I'm uh, kind of on the fence about him, but I've as an he was surprisingly good as an interviewer, which I didn't expect. Uh, but yeah, anybody but Tucker would have been good at this. Right. Uh, but that's why exactly the reason he took that interview. So uh, putting that to aside. So let's talk a little bit about the revisionist history that happened in the interview. And I just want to ask you about this point. What did, can you set the record? I can't believe I have to do this, but can we talk about how Poland didn't cause the World War II to happen? And because uh, I'm going to set the ground, uh, basically Putin's version of uh, World War II is that Poland left Hitler no choice. And then all the Russians wanted to do is just pass through Poland and then Poland wouldn't let them, so Russia also had to invade Poland. And he conveniently forgot the Ribbentrop-Molotov agreement and all that stuff. So can you set the record straight on that? Because you're a history uh, expert, not me here. Well, there's a there's another piece of that statement by Putin that I picked up on. He didn't just say Hitler had to invade Poland. He said Hitler had to invade Poland to carry out his plan. And what did Hitler use Poland for? Hitler used Poland for many of the death camps. And Vladimir Putin has his own death camps, as we've just discussed. And so I, I think it's actually even, it's, it is a historical distortion, but I think it's also a direct, slightly veiled, but not very veiled support of what Hitler did to the Jews. So that's thing one. Thing two, the only value to the world, I think, that came out of this Putin interview is it completely puts a lie to this idea that Russia had to go into Ukraine because of NATO expansion. You know, he tells this 800 year history. He talks about countries having to do certain things to carry out their plans. So I think this, this NATO BS is dead now, as far as I'm concerned, for people that actually want to think about it. But of course, what happened, what actually happened, again, it's sad that we have to talk about it, but what actually happened in the Second World War is that the Germans, having launched the First World War, beaten by the Allies, humiliated financially, economically on the world stage after the war by the victorious Allies, almost immediately after that, Adolf Hitler and his crowd um, set on their own 20-year plan or 1,000-year plan, I guess as they called it, to use false flags, use racism, use anti-Semitism, use thug tactics to destabilize Germany and they'll ultimately take over. And then part of what Hitler sold the German people on was we need Lebensraum. We need room for all the ethnic Germans to, to live comfortably in, 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 in wealth, which worked very well in Germany at the time because they were in the middle of the depression as well. And he could say that this is because of the allies and what they inflicted on them. So for a very long time in World War II, to your point, uh, the Soviet Union and Germany were actually, I would say, frenemies. You mentioned the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. It was essentially a non-aggression agreement right up until Hitler decided it wasn't. So I take away nothing at all from By the that. way, in that deal, they split Poland. They literally they said, hey, we'll take half. You guys take half, as you can see on the map. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very valuable map. Um, but I guess my point is, the the taking nothing away from the heroism and the privation and the suffering that the whatever 12 million Russians endured in World War II, uh, every Soviet leader and, and now Putin have this myth that they heroically saved the world from the Nazis. They only heroically saved the world from the Nazis after they were attacked by the Nazis because the Nazis flipped on them uh, after having invaded Poland and and, and mu much of the rest of Europe. So it's, it's all just complete BS. And it's unfortunate to me that so many people in the United States and apparently Western, the West are just buying it out of Putin's mouth all of a sudden. 
I think it's a, it's a testament of our education system, to be honest. Uh, in the United States, uh, uh, as a product of the U.S. higher education system, myself, yeah, it's it's second to none. It's the best in the world. Anything below that, high school level, elementary school, it's hot garbage. People come out, and unless they go to college, they don't understand what the fuck's going on in the world. And then they quote you fucking Bin Laden letters on TikTok, and they fall in love with Putin. But even and... even in a lot of universities, especially elite universities in the U.S., there's been in in most fields of study, except the sciences, largely uh, engineering, computer science, etc. There's been this indoctrination, and this is we can talk about this if you want. I think we talked about it before. KGB Russian propaganda 101 is to to convince a population that their own government and their own people are corrupt are illegitimate the institutions are fake the institutions are taken over and to exacerbate all the divisions and hate that already exist in a country with the goal of not any particular strategic outcome at any time although i'm sure putin would love to have us pulled out of nato right now but to just create chaos and show people that democracy is not the solution you think it is. And unfortunately, I mean, one of my daughters went to a very elite university and she was a critical thinker when she went in. And I mean, I love her to death and she's a very smart person and she's going to see the light one day, but she is completely indoctrinated by this colonization, decolonization, mythical narrative that is pushed now in, in a lot of our universities. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Oliver Quinn for the donation. Thank you, Oliver. I'll check it out. Uh, so I want to, I want to, I want to focus on that. Okay. So people don't understand when they watch this interview, what I want people to understand, and you kind of just scratch the surface on this. What was the purpose of this interview? Right. If you look at both, both parties of the interview, Tucker Carlson on the one hand, Putin <clears throat> on the second, on the other hand. Right. So what are the motives of, what are both of them trying to achieve from the interview? Right. Tucker's coming into the interview. He's trying to get attention. He's trying to get clicks. He wants to be controversial, edgy. He's playing to his base, et cetera, et cetera. Carlson got everything from that interview and some, okay? Yeah. Uh, so he definitely, huge W for, for Tucker. I can't blame him. You know, he's just uh, patting his pockets fine. What was Putin's goal in that interview? People, like, don't ask this question themselves. And it's really sad to me they don't. What was Putin trying to do? He's either trying to... Uh, uh, explain how he's the victim in this story and set the record straight or he's running a, a, a master plan that uh, it's basically an old ass playbook that is more relevant now than ever uh, and the kgb has never dreamt that their uh, two-step or three-step playbook to destabilize the united states would work so easily they didn't have social media back in the 70s yeah like so can you talk about specifically going to stage one, stage two, stage three of that uh, KGB playbook of uh, that was written in the 70s to try and destabilize and destroy the United States from inside and how that interview was a prime example of that because I think people need to hear that story. Yeah, so it's it's actually uh, even older than the 70s. The, the, the uh, new Soviet Union committed their first recorded act of uh, disinformation in about 13 days after they were declared uh, in the earlier parts of the prior century. And they developed their playbook in sort of in parallel with the Nazis. Uh, and much of the principles are the same. And they essentially, I already talked about the motive. The motive is always the same, and that is to destabilize Western democracy and ultimately lead to the demise of democracy and the rise of totalitarianism, as happened in every single country the Soviets took over in the last century, and as absolutely would happen in Ukraine if they would be allowed to win. And it relies on a number of key principles. And anybody who goes in X spaces and debates propagandists will see these regardless of whether the propaganda is coming from the Hamas side or the Russian side or the Iranian regime side. It's all the same principles. First of all, Hitler and um, I think uh, one of the early Russian leaders both said this, the bigger the lie, the more often you tell it, the more likely you are to be believed. 
So in the case of the Tucker interview, there was all kinds of big lies. There was that the United States did the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. There was the ridiculous alternative history that he gave uh, of, of, of why Russia's in Ukraine. There was the uh, fake, uh, the story about how we could have easily negotiated our way out of the war at the very beginning and the United States tricked tricked Zelensky, air quotes, into, uh, into not doing that. And then of course, the biggest lie of all, they're Nazis. Now, as we know, President Zelensky is Jewish. And sure, there, there are probably still, certainly were far right-wing groups in Ukraine, like in every other country in Europe. But when, when Putin uses the word Nazi or denazification, what he really means is anybody that's standing in the way of my goals for world domination or whatever else. So one big lie, there was plenty of those. Two, blame or become the victim. So become he, that's clear that he was trying to do that. He wanted to make Russia and Putin into the victim. Three, uh, deliberate misuse of sentiment. So this you see this all the time in the anti-Israeli propaganda by Russia. The KGB has been using this forever. Talk about the children. Talk about um, you know people being deceived. Uh, and then you have, of course, deploying the useful idiots. We talked about that at the beginning. Tucker Carlson, as you just said, um, first of all, I, I think found that for you, by the way, they, they somebody dug it oh, up. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Amazing. Like uh, the fact that you that Putin thinks you're too soft is uh, is is really saying something. I actually think, by the way, there's another useful idiot element to Tucker, assuming he's not literally on the payroll, uh, which I, you know, I don't think is the case, but I wouldn't rule it out. Um, and that is he got very spectacularly fired from Fox News. And if you've noticed, there's been this evolution of Fox News from, I guess, what people will call neocons uh, to incredible isolationism. And he got fired kind of when they were starting to make that transition. So I think he, this is also a big fuck you to Fox News and to the Murdochs, this complete embrace of Putin and of dictatorship. And then also in the KGB playbook, obviously deception. We talked about that repetition. Uh, you can't tell a story of Russian history for however long that took, 27 minutes, <laughs> without being quite repetitive. Um, and then also not necessarily involved in that interview, but deploying organizations and infiltrating organizations who will do your bidding for their own reasons. And that's a version of useful idiot but it's more organizational than that. So you see sort of the best example right now in the United States is this group Queers for Palestine. I have LGBTQ people in my family, nothing against them at all. But you ask yourself, why would a group that if they set foot in, I know this isn't about Israel, Gaza, but if they set foot in Gaza, they would be thrown off a building or hanged. Why would they be involved in pro-Palestinian protest? Well, because they've been co-opted by this movement. So those are the basics. I don't want to bore people with the lecture, but that that's you'll see this in all propaganda on all sides. My interviewee name is Brian Cunningham. Uh, what you see in his uh, uh, in his uh, avatar right now is uh, Denver Cunning. It's his handle on X where you can follow him and you should. But his name is Brian Cunningham. You can go Google him. His credentials are uh, legitimate. And uh, if, if it's okay with you, Brian, I can pull it up or you can send me a link. But uh, former uh, former CIA, former White House consultant, uh, feel free to Google him. Uh, he's a public figure. So thank you for that question. If people want to, if people have insomnia and they want to uh, get some sleep, it's very easy to file, find hundreds of hours of me on the internet talking about things like banning TikTok in the US and yeah. uh, the, this Chinese spy balloon and all the rest of it. But I will- uh, I, I warn you not to fuck with him though, cause he has access to unlimited legal counsel. <laughs> 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 He'll bury you back in paperwork. <laughs> yes, I, I also happen to be a lawyer, so I don't have to pay fees. Yeah. And I've got a bunch of lawyers that work for me. Uh, yeah. Where can I, if I put if I put my bio in the comments, is that good? Uh, there's a private chat. You can send it to me here. Oh, okay, yeah. And then I can post it if, you, if it's okay with you so people can see it. So uh, while you do that, and I'll pull it up right now, uh, I want to ask you another question. 
because uh, we're not going to be just on the interview. Uh, but uh, since people asked, uh, I'm going to share this thing right here. Um, and then uh, we can move on. So, yeah, and okay. uh, anybody wants to follow me at Denver Cunning, you'll probably see much more of what I have to say than you ever wanted to. <laughs> That's the okay. cyber. I founded a cybersecurity institute at the University of California, Irvine, but it has a lot of my bio in there too. So that's uh, Brian's bio. As you can see, uh, the CV is on the screen. Uh, a picture sometimes is worth a, th a thousand words. So uh, while we, we let people a chance to read this, uh, your impressive CV, I want to ask you a second question about the interview before we move on to the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, so in the interview, uh, are you familiar, by the way, with Posner, the Russian yeah. uh, media guy? He used yeah. to do a show with, uh, with Donahue. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. You you shocked? I know this, right? Yeah, Vladimir Posner. I had forgotten yeah. about that. Yeah, he's. Uh, I always envied his English. I was like, why can't I sound like that? Because I can't shake my accent. And uh, his English was crispy yeah, cream. It was, was like, it was pretty much native. Yeah, native as fuck. I was like, ah, hate him so much. Anyways, so he's <laughs> an articulate speaker. He's very very. He's a Putin chill, okay. He's a he's a institutional right. guy. I think he's also a he's Russian intelligence. I'm sure. Oh, anyways, cool. so anyways, so he is the guy who's been promoting for the last twenty years. The idea is that Russia is being uh, fucked based on this uh, idea that when Gorbachev gave the green light to bring down the wall in Berlin and effectively end the cool. you know the soviet union yeah. right in its current configuration he's done that based on a promise that was given to him that nato won't move an inch and since then the west has completely fucked putin by breaking that promise and now putin is in full entitlement to go break bad and take over ukraine basically that's the argument now as somebody who worked for the intelligence services who's somebody who's you know, being in contact with people who know these things is how how credible is this claim that a promise was given to Gorbachev about no NATO expansion is beyond uh, 1990. So uh, I believe it's complete fiction. I was actually that was one of the rare times I was out of government because I was in law school. I'd worked for President Reagan and then I went to law school and came back uh, to the CIA during President Clinton's time. But I believe our former secretary, of, well, first of all, there's absolutely nothing in writing. And also, it's kind of ironic for any Russian leader to complain about other countries breaking their agreements because Russia has never honored a single treaty that they've ever signed, as far as I know, at least not in the areas I care about. Um, so that's thing one. But thing two is, I believe our sec. I'm trying to look this up right now so I don't get it wrong. I believe our Secretary of State at the time, James Baker, and Condoleezza Rice, my future boss at the time, who was the special, I think she was Senior Director for Russian Affairs at the National Security Council. I believe they have both said that that never happened. I, I'm not 100% sure about Condi, so I don't, I'm not, I'm not saying that definitively, but I'm fairly certain Baker has said that that never happened. And it, it sort of doesn't make sense either, right? Because NATO is a voluntary organization. Um, it would have been very foolhardy, I think, for and I think President Bush at the time, H.W. Bush, was too smart for this to make that kind of promise because then you'd have it's very counterproductive to Western security because you'd have all these countries wanting to become democratic, wanting to deal with corruption, all the things you need to do to become a member, and uh, that would have been against our interests. Most important point, though, is if I remember correctly, there was a time when either Yeltsin or I think it was actually even Putin asked to join NATO. So obviously the idea that they were promised NATO would never. I think it was involve, Putin. Not I think it was Putin. That. Yeah, I think it was Putin. But uh, here's the crazy part. Uh, the Putin shills, they don't want to do Googling because this is like one Google search away. Yeah, Gor even uh, Gorbachev himself says it never Gorbachev happened. Gorbachev himself, who yeah. was the subject of this promise. Yeah. So I just want to remind you the premise. The premise is, and Putin has used this uh, the story numerous times in his speeches, in, the, in, in his uh, theory. He used this multiple times. He said, look, 
they've lied to us again and again. They they've told us this. They said they were, and then so the motherfucker just went ahead and asked Gorbachev when he was alive. Said what the fuck? What the fuck? And then well, I want to show you. So that is that is conclusive proof to me. But also, I've now found. Uh, this quote from my former boss, Condoleezza Rice, who, as I said, at the end of the Cold War, she was a White House National Security Council staff member. And she says, quote, the idea that we somehow cross some line with the Russians on NATO, I think, is a figment of Vladimir Putin's imagination, just like the idea that somehow Jim Baker, all the way back in 1990, said we would never move east. What we were talking about at the time was purely East Germany. Nobody was even imagining. Oh, I'm reading what's on the screen, so people can read it. That's but, Gorbachev's um, thing. That's not Condi Rice. Okay, good. So let me let me just real, real quickly finish. Um, so she said nobody at the time was even imagining Czechoslovakia or Poland or Hungary. They weren't mm -hmm. even thinking about that at all. Also, the National Security Archive at George Washington University recently released a large number of previously classified documents that the um, this is bullshit. So anyway. The, Gor the Gorbachev quote is a better one, but I think it's just a fic it's just fiction, and it's fiction because it helps Putin's narrative of wanting to rebuild the Soviet Union. Remember, Putin said that the destruction of the Soviet Union was the worst tragedy in the 20th century, not the Holocaust, yep. not the tens of millions of people yep. Russia killed. Yeah, well, look, they've asked, uh, look, uh, and he's talking about Baker. He said, uh, well, did Baker promise to you? And uh, let me tell you when, I th when they asked him this. Uh, Okay, so they asked him, they doesn't say when, but they've asked him about Baker's, what Baker promised him or didn't promise him. And then Gorbachev said, the topic of NATO expansion was not discussed at all. And it wasn't brought up in those years. Another issue we brought up was discussed, making sure that NATO's military structures would not advance and that additional armed forces wouldn't be deployed in the territory of the GDR, which was East Germany. Uh, and the... Uh, Baker's statement was made in that context. Everything that could have been and needed to be done to solidify that political obligation was done and fulfilled. And that's, so basic that's consistent with Condi Rice's recollection, which I just read, which is that it wouldn't have even occurred to anyone to have a conversation about Hungary or Ukraine or the Baltic states at that time. Yeah. And by the way, that's uh, if you needed a reason why Putin never attended Gorbachev's uh, uh, funeral. Because when he died, Putin like made a spectacle out of not going to the funeral. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now you understand why. I mean, uh, uh, anyways. So well, also, I'm sure Putin blamed Gorbachev for the worst tragedy of the 20th century. Air quotes. The collapse of the USSR. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, Gorbachev uh, made a lot of mistakes. Look, but uh, he said, "Look, uh, I didn't want the bloodshed." on my hands of what would happen if we didn't let the wall uh, fall. So uh, at the end of the day, he'll go down in history as a, as a real one. Anyways. Oh, yeah. uh, so I think uh, we're done with the interview. I'm trying to think if there's any more interview issues that I want to talk about here. We covered, I think most of it. Um, well, I just, I made a few notes that there, there, there was a moment I didn't write down the exact words, but there was a moment where, uh, I'm sure there was many of these moments, but I, I really remember one I'm trying to find it here where um, uh, where Tucker actually helps him out. Like if Putin didn't quite uh, get all of the propaganda points he he wanted. So uh, uh, Tucker actually asked Putin a question that would help him, uh, you know, push his prep propaganda even more. I can't find it right now, but we, I'll, I'll, I'll post it if I find it. Yeah, well, uh, DM is saying in the comments, uh, I know very educated PhD engineers who, who think Tucker is the best journalist ever. Yeah, it's not about being book smart. Uh, right. Yeah, uh, that's so what here's I was, a, yeah. I'm just going to say, that's what I was getting at before, DM, is the term useful idiot has nothing to do with the intelligence level of the person you're talking about. It just means they're being used. Uh, by the way, uh, Mel, it's there's no such thing as a CIA officer. <laughs> no, 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 they don't exist. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So look, I want to address this, and then Brian, I'll let you answer this. Yeah. Uh, how much do you think Putin was successful? And uh, I was joking, but bad joke. How much uh, you think Putin was successful in uh, creating that uh, destabilization uh, inside the US through basically um, vilifying the law enforcement agencies? And uh, through that, the government. I mean, I think he was quite successful. 
Listen, I, as a former CIA officer, we could talk about the quote unquote bloody history some other time. Um, but as a, as a former CIA officer, I'm actually incredibly jealous of what Putin has pulled off here. It will go down in history as, if not the most successful intelligence operation of all time, one of them. Because think about it. I, I did a long series of posts about this the other day that people can go find in my feed. But um, the main goal of an intelligence service is to collect information from the highest levels of the government of your enemy and to try to predict what they're going to do. And most importantly, for, especially from Putin's standpoint, get them to do what you want. And so the goal, obviously the gold standard of any intelligence agency in the world would be to have on your payroll or otherwise compromised uh, senior leadership of your main enemy. Now, whatever you think about Trump actual relationship with Russia, and I'm not going to comment on that. People can reach their own conclusions. He could not be a more effective asset for them if he was fully recruited. He has been he has been very successful in in exactly, Tom, what you're talking about as Putin's goal, which is discrediting law enforcement agencies, intelligence agencies, the courts, the Congress, the press, the military, every institution of American society. Incredibly successful, partly because of the propaganda that Putin has pushed out and the fact that social media allows you to industrialize that. And partly because for whatever reason, Trump always, 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 always parrots exactly what the Putin line is on things. And you posted this a couple of days ago, or maybe yesterday, you found the clip from uh, 2017, 2018, where Trump is telling uh, uh, Bill, uh, what's that guy's name? Bill uh, from Fox, the guy that used to be on Fox. Um, he's in an interview with him at the Super Bowl years ago, seven years ago, uh, Bill O'Reilly. And he says almost the exact same words that Tucker Carlson said in his interview with Putin uh, two weeks ago that, you know, well, sure, dictators kill people, but our country kills people. And I guess when you're a leader, you have to kill people. I mean, really almost the exact same words. So they have been incredibly successful in destabilizing the country and making us doubt every institution. I don't think it's a coincidence that for the first 225 years of our country, we had exactly one impeachment of a president and it was unsuccessful. And then in the modern age, the propaganda age, we've had three in the last 20 years. We've had more challenges to our elections in the courts. And this is a result of the destabilizing efforts of foreign propaganda and also, in my opinion, Trump amplifying those messages. So that's one side of the equation. The other side is, <clears throat> You have now at least a former and possibly future president of the United States, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who's second in line to the presidency after the vice president, multiple senators and Congress people on the far right in the United States, and a bunch of people on the far left, the squad, the Rashida Tlaibs of the world, all of whom are doing exactly what the Russians would want them to do. Whether or not they're actually recruited and paid, doesn't matter. In fact, it's almost better for Putin if they're not. When they're not. Paid. Yeah. So yeah. it's 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 breathtaking and it's it's terrifying to be honest. People in America love their uh, man, conspiracy theories. That's what I noticed, and uh, I get it. They're a lot of fun, and and uh, I'm not saying uh, that uh, you people are saints. You know what I mean? But I mean, uh, I think he really. Social media has catapulted this playbook way oh, beyond the wildest dreams of the KGB. Absolutely. And, and also compared to what it cost in terms of rubles and potential human lives and yeah. time to do the disinformation. 20 they do it for free now. They do it for free. Yeah, it's, free. Yeah. it's on TikTok yeah, every, single, yeah, every single day. Yeah. And you've now established, uh, you've expanded the pool of potential useful idiots from probably a couple million to every yes. single person on the planet that has a um, computer or a phone. But let me just, just let me just real quick to Mel's point, because it's still up on the screen about the blood his, bloody history of the CIA. Um, not just to talk about the CIA, but I think it's pretty relevant. So yes, Central Intelligence Agency at the direction of US presidents, not on their own, did some things in the late mid and late 20th century that I wish they would not have done. But here's the thing. They were 70 years ago. 
Same thing with this colonization, decolonization bullshit. Yes, Western countries did terrible things in the name of colonization a hundred or more years ago. Who's colonizing the world today? It's Russia, it's China, and it's the regime Iran. in Tehran. And so yeah. I'd love for Mel to say the same thing about those bloody histories as he or she is saying about the CIA. Yeah, meanwhile, uh, uh, sorry, Mel, not a personal attack at you, but meanwhile, Iran is now owning Yemen, it's owning Lebanon, it's owning Syria, and it's pushing through another three or four countries as we speak. So uh, they just don't officially announce, but uh, they they own uh, they own the Middle East at this point. I mean, talk about and and, but- and and the other thing on top of all of the rest of it is it's it's reinstituting the norms of colonization and dictatorship and expansion that we thought were dead after the 20th century. And case in point is Venezuela. Venezuela put a vote in their legislature authorizing, Mm -hmm. in air quotes, their president to invade their next door neighbor for the sole reason of stealing oil and energy. I mean, that a lot of countries have had that ambition, obviously, and act on it. But to so brazenly go to your legislature in public and get a law that tells you that a lot of countries around the world believe all the rules are gone and they can do whatever they want. I'm going to give a shout out to Sarah. She's really enjoying this interview. So the credit goes to my my guest. Uh, I think beyond the, you don't have to pull up records before we move on to the Middle East a little bit here. Uh, You need to tell me your hard stop because I'm trying to plan the interview accordingly. So Uh, how much time we have? Well, I can go for sure another 20 minutes if that works. Okay, 20 minutes from now, it's perfect for us. Yeah. So I'll take, uh, you remember how Putin said, just one minute uh, for history and then it went for 45 fucking minutes. Yeah. Mother, anyways, so uh, I want to say something, and I, I want to offer you an explanation here. The NATO theory, which is the bedrock of all the Putin apologists yeah. and the self-hating Americans, is that uh, well, you know, uh, at the it's 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 the U.S. and the Europeans' fault because NATO expansion pushed Putin into this. Fine. I'll accept your logic. They promised to him. I'll accept your logic. He went to Ukraine because Ukraine started to think about applying to NATO. Okay, cool. Meanwhile, uh, Finland just joined fucking NATO and it shares a massive border with Russia and he doesn't give a fuck. So how do you settle that? Well, that doesn't compute. First of all, we've already shown through people that were there, Gorbachev and Condi Rice, that the promise never happened. Yeah, never happened. But secondly, this is what I was saying at the beginning. Putin going through that 800 year history of uh, of Russia, air quotes, and Ukraine in order to demonstrate why it's his territory. That right there puts the lie to the fact that it had anything to do with NATO expansion. But what I think is the greatest F you and thank you, Samsa. What I think is the greatest F you you could possibly give to Putin is Finland joining NATO and now, hopefully shortly, uh, Sweden joining NATO. That's his worst nightmare. And that should, to a rational person, tell you maybe invading other countries is not the way to get what you want. But I'm not sure he will have learned that lesson. And the by only, the way, the only way he learns the lessons is being de- right. defeated in Ukraine. So, uh, Sam, Samsa, uh, just uh, want to give you guys a shout out because uh, Finland literally went to war with Russia when it was called the USSR and fucked them up. Now, not absolutely, I'm go- you can't win a war against Russia long term uh, as as a you know country size to size it wouldn't match. But the Russians took a lot of a lot of pain uh, in that war. That helped them against the Germans because they were much more prepared for the winter war. But in that Finland war, they got fucked up. Yeah, yeah. The Finnish were heavily undermanned, uh, under-equipped, and they fucked up uh, uh, the Soviets back in that uh, in that war. By the way, Tom, so, I wonder what happened to all those uh, supposedly innocent migrants that Putin uh, bust to the Finnish border then to try to do a soft invasion of Finland. I, I wonder if they've been allowed to go back to their home countries or if they're in prison camps or what happened to those people 
I've met a few. Uh, by the way, I met a few Finnish people in my life, and they were gnarly as fuck. They're uh, tough. They're tough yeah. motherfuckers, bro. They, yeah. they because they look they look so nice and they're polite, but they're tough motherfuckers, bro. Oh yeah, I met a few. Yeah, yeah, uh, some crazy fuckers. Anyways, so uh, shout you out to have them in NATO. Yeah, that's a good addition. Um, and unlike uh, the French, they'll actually pull their weight. <laughs> yeah. No offense to the French, but you guys suck. <laughs> I could, hey, hey uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, Tom. I don't know how many French uh, fans you have. I'm hopefully, kidding. I'm hopefully kidding. Hopefully they won't be offended, Tom. But I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but I recently bought a uh, French combat rifle off of eBay. Um, um, do you know how I knew it was authentic? How? Never been fired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, well, French people. I love you. I'm just yeah. teasing. Well, look, the French, um, no offense to the French, but uh, the military strategy comes down to two very weird decisions. One, let's put everything we got into a barcation line, which people just drove around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the other one is like, uh, yeah, we don't want to fight because the city is too beautiful. We don't want to fuck up the city, so just take it. Yeah. I mean, motherfucker, you know, never mind. All this yeah, ancient, the, world, ancient, the world would have been yeah. a very different place if those months had been uh, handled differently, I think. Yeah, here we go. Some French people getting offended in the comments. I'm going to lose subscribers. I know. I apologize. It's just we're, a- just, we're just kidding. We're just kidding. We love the French. We love the okay, French. Okay, let me, just- let me be even-handed about it. I'll think of something to insult America about in a minute. But in the British, yeah. let's talk about the uh, UK for a second. You go to any British war memorial, yeah. Not again, not taking anything away from the heroics of the British people, but the only battles they ever lost historically are ones where they were faced by a far superior force in air quotes. If yeah. you go to like the Imperial War Museum and places like that. Well, no no offense to the French people. I honestly don't uh, don't mean it in a bad way. Uh, it, it's it's not anything. Uh, uh... Anyways, moving well, on. Also, also, we should say that not every person who lives in a country is responsible for the terrible decisions of their leaders. Either. Oh, that's true. That's true. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Anyways, so uh, friends aside, I've probably lost like a couple hundred subscribers. That's okay. So oh. friends aside, uh, let's move over to another part of the world. And uh, I want you to make that point in the 12 minutes we have left, uh, connecting the dots. Because uh, a lot of people in America, and America is going through some... Um, if, if it's a cycle, right? Globalization, deglobalization, globalization, deglobalization. It's like breathing, right? Lung expands, it contracts, right? So right now we're in the process of deglobalization. We're extra, we're kind of a, going back home, more a separatism, you know, everything that happened in pre-World War II, right? The yeah. old system is dying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Fine. But can you explain to the people in America how everything is connected? Because I want them to understand how the Middle East situation is connected to the Ukraine situation and it's con- connected to the Taiwan situation, how all of this comes together. Yep. So I highly recommend, uh, I can put it in the chat if you want, I highly recommend people go uh, and and watch uh, an interview. Well, first of all, if you if, don't mind, I'm going to put In the new on. economy, Sorry. average people are becoming millionaires faster Sorry. and easier than ever before. Got caught on a YouTube ad there. Uh, first of all, I, if you don't mind, Tom, I'll put um, my podcast in the chat, The Hidden History Happy Hour. Hopefully people will check it out. We uh, we tell uh, strange and unusual and unknown stories from history while we uh, try to drink the alcohol that our characters would have been drinking. So you can imagine that when we get on to our second or third story, uh, it's kind of an amusing time. So that's in the chat if people want to check it out. Appreciate it. But then I'd also want to drop in an interview that was done really at the height of the Cold War back in the 1980s when I actually was a Central Intelligence Agency analyst about the KGB. And Tom, I'm sure you've seen this. It's with a KGB Russian intelligence defector who defected to the West uh, in the early 80s, late 70s. His name is Yuri Bezmenov. And when you watch this interview, which I highly encourage people to do, It'll by the way, you. just put your podcast on the screen. So oh, thank you very much. Yeah, check it out, everybody. I'd appreciate it. Tom, we're going to have Tom on a get, as a guest pretty soon if he's willing to come. Um, but this guy, uh, Bezmanov, you watch his interview from the early 80s, and it, it'll strike 
a modern audience is very like oldie timey. The, the guy that interviews him is very dramatic and he was kind of a right wing agitator at the time in the US. Uh, but Bezmenov was the real deal. He was an actual defector from the Soviet KGB. And he explained, and there's also... It was a, him and uh, Pasepa, the guys who spilled the, the beans, right? The Romanian right. guy and this guy. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, him. so Prasepa, I was just about to get there. Thank you. Prasepa was the head... I know my stuff. Huh? I know my, uh, my Russian do? spice. Yeah. I know my Russian spice. <laughs> yeah. So Prasepa was, when I was an K- uh, analyst for the KGB, Prasepa was the head of Romanian intelligence. And for those who don't remember the Cold War or have read some disinformation about it, in the U- USSR uh, and the so-called Eastern Bloc, the countries that were uh, basically Soviet puppet states during the last half of the 20th century, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, Romania, East Germany, Bulgaria, um, all of these places were run by the Russians as dictatorships. And Prasepa was the head of essentially the Romanian version of the KGB. So to tie this to what's happening in the Middle East. Um, Persepa, when he defected to the West, he told, I'm just scrolling here so I can find his exact words. He told the stories of how he, on behalf of the Soviet KGB, would run their assets in the Muslim resistance movement, including, by name, Yasser Arafat. And Persepa, the head of Romanian intelligence, talked about how he would him, he would personally take bags of cash to Arafat uh, in in uh, in the Middle East and pay him off. He was a Russian paid agent for decades, and so by the way was and possibly is uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority today. And what the KGB head Yuri Andropov, who later became the Premier of Russia, told uh, Persepa uh, early on was quote. We needed to instill, nice, nice, very nice. We needed to instill. You, a, you can still the big players. Who, you, you just tell them who, some young people may not know who's the head guy in this shot. Well, go ahead. You, you tell it. It's your, it's your shot. No, no, you're the, you're the head guy. You're the guest. Go ahead. Uh, I, can't, I can't pick them all up by name. So continue. So Pasepa's quote about the Arafat. Yeah, so uh, so he so and Dropoff, the head of the KGB, sent uh, c- called in Persepa and gave him his marching orders. And he said, "Quote: We needed to instill a Nazi-style hatred for the Jews throughout the Islamic world, and to turn this weapon of the emotions into a terrorist bloodbath against Israel." Close quote. So the Palestinian Liberation Army, the original PLA just like the Bolivian National Liberation Army before it, was created by the KGB. The phrase, Zionism is racism, which was enshrined in a UN General Assembly resolution in the 70s, and which became the basis for decades of uh, bloodbaths, was literally written in the KGB and in the, in the mid-60s. They then used bribery, extortion, threats, influence, propaganda over the next eight or nine years to convince a majority of the United Nations General Assembly countries in the 70s to vote that into a resolution. Zionism is racism. They, the KGB, made it up. And at the time, the American ambassador to the United Nations, Daniel Daniel Patrick Moynihan, said on the floor of the United Nations that if you do this, if you pass this into a resolution, It'll create decades of hatred and bloodbath, which, of course, it did. Luckily, under George H.W. Bush in 1991, the U.N. General Assembly voted to reverse that. So it's not even a part of U.N. uh, quote unquote law anymore. All of this stuff was created by Moscow. Why? Because, again, the goal of Russia, then the Soviet Union, Russia again, always the same to create as much chaos in the world as possible so their form of dictatorship can take over as a predominant form in government in the world. And then they can do what they did to Romania and Bulgaria and the other East European countries, which is rape them of their natural resources and colonize them. And so one fun fact, Tom, which I know you know, is that at the earliest days of the state of Israel, the Soviet Union supported them. 
including giving them weapons. Then when they realized that uh, it wasn't in their interest, this is when they flipped and supported the Arab countries and created all this propaganda around the Jews. But if any of this sounds familiar, I'll stop reading now, but it's just so powerful. This comes from some documents that were uh, stolen and taken out of the Soviet Union, not by uh, Bezbedov, but by a person named Matrokin, M-I-T-R-O-K-H-I-N, I believe. And if people Google the Matrokin archive, there's thousands of pages of this stuff. This guy was literally in the 50s and 60s, the KGB historian, the Russian intelligence historian. So he took handwritten notes of all the documents and he smuggled out a bunch of documents. And here were the principles that were enshrined in the KGB's uh, propaganda in the 60, 1960s in support of their operations in the Middle East. Uh, the goal was for the Palestinian Liberation Organization to express the will, air quotes, of all Arabs living in the region. They created the slogan, Palestine is not just the name for a geographic region, but the home for a distinct and indigenous people, the Palestinian Arabs, this is all creation of Russian propaganda. Its Jewish citizens are colonizers from unidentified foreign countries, usually Europe, and as opposed to Jews having a you know actual homeland in the Middle East. Here's another one of their propaganda points that will sound very familiar today, but it goes back 50 years. Israel practices apartheid in which Arab citizens of Israel are prevented from advancing. Arab poverty in the territories controlled by Arabs is due to Israel rather than to the Arab rulers or Hamas or the PLO. These are all literally word for word KGB propaganda points that you'll still hear people talking about today. So the way this connects is not only does Moscow fund, and I strongly suspect, and there's evidence in Gaza to suggest this, train and equip these liberation organizations, including Hamas. And of course, the regime in Iran does the same thing, but they also have literally made up the ideology behind them and successfully convinced a huge percentage of the world uh, to buy into it. If not because they give a shit about Arabs or Muslims or anyone else, but because it, it helps the Russian interest in chaos and dictatorship in the world. And I believe I'm not too old to realize that's Brezhnev with their affair, right? That's uh, Brezhnev. And yeah. uh, so... Uh, and Brezhnev that, was the Soviet premier at the time, yeah. Yeah. So the guy you, you, you that was on the screen, the guy with the glasses, that was Pasepa, uh, yeah. lurking behind uh, Ceausescu. That was... Uh, Ceausescu was in the front. That's uh, the one Ceausescu. I could get, Ceausescu. Yeah. Yeah, Ceausescu is hard for me to talk about because... Uh, he heard a lot of people. Um, oh, yeah, I have a lot of Romanian friends. So Ceausescu was. Uh, imagine Saddam Hussein had a kid with the devil. So that would be Ceausescu. The way they executed these motherfuckers, him and his wife, was so vicious. But uh, uh, anyway, so yeah. Ceausescu was a puppet. He yeah. was basically uh, an asset. And then uh, Pasepa was just the. The when you say Romanian, KG, he was basically a KGB field officer running Romania on behalf of the KGB. And uh, what what I'm pulling up on the screen right now is from my own Patreon. Uh, in our Patreon, we posted this article, and uh, in in this article, I quote the stuff that Pasepa told uh, about uh, a recruiting, as you can see here on the screen. Basically, they they picked up Yasser Arafat. Uh, out of a middle class neighborhood in Cairo. Yeah. He had nothing to do with uh, Israel or Palestine and none of that shit. So they dug him up from Cairo, from some middle class neighborhood. <clears throat> they faked his birth certificate to comply with the, being a Palestinian. Yeah. And they trained him. It's just he outperformed the Colombian guys and the Bolivian guys. He was much better than them. And uh, he outlived the KGB. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, what Pasepa is saying that the plan for him to become a peace activist was put in place long before he got that Nobel Prize and Bill Clinton yeah. stuff and everything. So he, while he was, uh, they were prepping for the, uh, the 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 formation of the PLO, Pasepa was training him. Hey, you have to at some point flip and tell them what they want to hear. And tell them how you want to a peaceful arrangement. You want to coexist, et cetera, et cetera. So you can you can get in the system and they and and fuck it up from inside. So 
what happened in the 90s with Yasser Arafat, the Palestinian state, the Palestinian Authority, that was all planned in advance years ago. If if you say whatever you want about the KGB, but they were really good at playing the long game. Oh, yeah. They were really good at playing the long game. Uh, similarly, like the Iranians and the Chinese, these guys are yeah. really, really good at playing the long game. But he was basically saying, look, uh, I've been paying Yasser Arafat like $200,000 a, a, a week or a month or whatever, like, he was he basically had detailed payments, uh, training, everything. In fact, the entire charter of the PLO was written yeah. in Moscow <laughs> and voted yeah. in Moscow uh, by Palestinian representatives. So uh, people don't know the, this shit. Probably the Hamas charter, too, with all of its uh, genocidal language. Um, but if you watch that interview with the other defector, Bezmanov, um, it's chilling because he's speaking in the 80s about plans that the KGB set in motion even before that, specifically to try to uh, infiltrate elite universities and in, in institute into generations of, and he was talking about Americans, but Westerners, this narrative. At the time, it was communism versus capitalism, but they're very good at changing their narrative for the time. So now it's colonialism versus decolonialism. And he said, by the time we're done, it'll be too late and it'll take generations of you to clean up our mess. And if you look at what's happening today, uh, you know, 40 years later, he pretty much predicted it on the nose. It took longer than he yeah. thought, but we're there now. And the most chilling thing, and then I'll shut up because people can watch the interview if they want or not, is he said that their, their MO, their modus operandi was always the same. They would go into a country they wanted, I'm talking about Russia now, and they would infiltrate the elites, the universities, journalists, uh, both on the far right and on the far left, by the way. And they found the right wingers more valuable because they thought the left wingers in some cases were just not even smart enough to really get it. But the point is they would convince these people that it was in their interest to overthrow their own society. And here's the punchline, he said, this is chilling. He said, after our successful revolutions, the first people we put up against the wall and shoot are the elites and the intelligentsia that bought into our propaganda about the future utopia, because we know once they find out it was all bullshit, they'll rise up against us. So all of you new Putin sympathizers in the United States, think about that. That's what they've done in Russia. In 1917, the supporters of the revolution were the intellectuals. And then they lined them all up and they systematically for the next 10 years killed all of them. Yep. And remember Cambodia, which was also inspired by the same ideology in Cambodia, when the Pol Pot dictator took over and committed genocide, they would kill people just because they were wearing glasses because they assumed that meant they were part of the intelligentsia. <laughs> so I guess I'm glad I didn't live in uh, Cambodia <laughs> back in the day. Uh, but so, Brian, uh, I want to give you a huge shout out to the 423 people who are watching this live. As Thank you speak. so much. Uh, it's Thanks a massive, so massive uh, uh, recognition of, uh, I guess, uh, your interview skills, your credentials. So I'm going to take the banner off the screen right now. And uh, I know I have to let you go. You're a busy motherfucker. <laughs> uh, you can follow Brian on X, which I highly advise you, you do so. He's not very good at building a personal brand because he's actually a professional, but he shares a lot of interesting and unique insights about what's actually going on. Uh, Denver Cunning on X. Uh, we have, of course, uh, the podcast, which I'll go on as a guest, hopefully when you guys are uh, willing to take me. Absolutely. And uh, I really want to thank you for coming on today. I think people have really uh, learned a lot of new stuff. Uh, and uh, Somebody asked this. Uh, look, Tom, where are you from? I'm from Schitt's Creek. <laughs> <laughs> <I've>, that's my <laughs> with or without a paddle, though. Tom. Uh, the hey, here's one, thing, one last thing I want to say. First of all, thank you so much for having me on. It's been great. I love coming on your show. I think I follow you. I follow everything you do, including on your financial side. So for anybody, who, yeah. anybody who's a viewer who who uh, follows Tom's financial advice. I have been uh, not only an investor in Palantir, but an advisor to them for 17 years. And uh, it's an amazing company with an amazing yeah. mission. And Tom is wise to buy and hold. Yeah, Palantir understand the global geopolitical map. 
better than every other tech company in the world. Unfortunately, even better than Tesla, which is, uh, you know, it, it's hard for me to say because I'm such a huge Elon fan and Tesla fan. But the geopolitical map is changing. And the Alex Karp and Peter Thiel were talking about this back in 2003. Yeah. They're saying, hey, guys, things are like this utopia. Post-World War II system is collapsing. And we're going to be ready for this. You guys can build your houses out of uh, wheat and uh, and paper. We're, we're going to build a brick fucking house. And now they're the only ones who are prepped for this. And if yeah, you haven't yet, go go read the Times, uh, the Time article about the, about Palantir, which has nothing to do with the. the it's just pure about the, the, the business, work. not the yeah the work. Work, yeah, and 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 uh, it's no coincidence that the CEO Alex Karp was the first uh, Western executive to go into Ukraine during the war and into yep. Israel during the Gaza genocide. So one last question, Brian, before you go. Beach Boy, I love that name. Uh, uh, yeah, some of the best music ever written, by the way, by these guys. Yes. Yes, Unfortunately, yes. Brian got, not you, the other Brian, he got fucked by the Beatles because they literally copied them and uh, did way better. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I'm, I'm an old soul. Anyways, so yeah. last question. Beach Boy is asking you, could you, he's asking you, what's next for the Middle East, in your yeah. opinion? Well, so great question. Um, you know, I'm not a uh, expert on the internal politics or the regional politics in the Middle East, but my sense of it, having um, now, you know, talked about it every day on X for three or four months, is that, first of all, it's crystal clear to me that Hamas conducted their genocidal invasion when they did, because their masters in Tehran and Moscow, but particularly Tehran, uh, we're very, very concerned about the Abraham Accords and no yep. coincidence that the Saudi uh, crown prince and the Israeli prime minister had less than two weeks before gone on Fox News and said they were about to sign a peace agreement. So that was the original strategic goal. So when this is over, I have no doubt, first of all, that the, Israel is going to decisively win this. They are going to destroy Hamas's combat capability. Uh, they they are going above and beyond any military in world history in terms of their protection of civilians. We can talk about that some other time. Um, so I think they will be successful. I don't think the world's going to get them to stop. By the way, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, ruled specifically that. Yet everybody forgot to report in that part of the of the news. But well, so just real quick on the ICJ, Tom. I know you and I, I think, feel the same about it. On the one hand, it is a kangaroo court, uh, yeah. not a real court with real justice, but even in that institution, in which has a Russian judge and a Chinese judge, and I think 14 out of the 17 or 13 out of the 17 are hostile uh, to Israel. Um, even in the first case they took that South Africa brought, they did not order Israel to do anything differently than they were already doing. But what they did do is order Hamas to release all the hostages yeah. immediately, which of course they haven't done. Yeah. Now what you're talking about is there was another case that was brought and they said, sorry, nothing to see here. Israel, just keep doing what you're doing. But what's most important by contrast is in March of 2022, this same court with most of the same judges ordered Russia to stop their, geno uh, their genocidal invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. But just to circle back real quick to the Middle East. So what I think is gonna happen and by the way, I pulled up on the screen this little thing that you can also mention. The I oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very important. So um, part of why. So let me back up for just a quick second. So most people know the Abraham Accords were initiated under the Trump administration uh, in significant part by his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. And by, by the way, I explained at the beginning the reasons I don't like Trump, because I think he wants to be a dictator and I like our democracy and I think he's too close to Putin. But he did something really important with the Abraham Accords. And, and the reason you know it's so valuable is that when the Biden people came in, just like any time the White House changes parties in the U.S., the instinct is always to do the opposite of what the last guy did, but not the Abraham Accords. Biden's administration has been pushing them hard as well, which makes you know what a good idea it is because these two enemies both think it's a good idea. And I believe Israel will win decisively. They will destroy Hamas's military capability. They'll get their leaders. They will uh, then uh, hopefully not have to fight a war in the north with Hezbollah. I think it's still a little early to say what's going to happen there. But then what I think is going to happen is the Abraham Accords will go full forward. Saudi will 
sign. The rest of the Gulf states will sign. Um, there will be trillions of dollars of new economic investment, including, as Tom is showing, the uh, economic, the new economic corridor, which I think is a lot of the reason why Saudi Arabia is so excited about doing this. It will, it will screw the regime in Iran economically. It'll screw uh, the Russians economically. It'll undermine the whole BRICS movement, I think. Uh, and I think it's going to make a lot of pull a lot of people out of poverty in the Middle East. So I think I'm they're very, fighting over the blue country here, if to be honest, Brian. Say again. I think India is the key to this whole thing. Talk about in, that. Bro. Without India, BRICS is a hot pile of trash. Yeah, like and there's you, there's no. Is there any indication that India will not be part of this corridor once it's all said and done? No, the opposite. Yeah, that's yeah. that's circled around India's ability to export. Yeah. Well, that it's and also, out, I, uh, I really don't think most of the world wants the ruble or the uh, yuan to be their reserve currency either. So, you know how many subscribers are lost explaining that to people? It's like the, the the dollar is not going anywhere because there's no replacement. It's like, no, it's the end of the U.S. dollar. Okay, if it's who who else? <laughs> what are you gonna? Do? You want to get paid in yuan, motherfucker? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in rubles? Exactly. Should we pay in rubles? So, in South African rand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. So Beach Boy, I'm optimistic, actually, at the moment. I think it, 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 there's a lot of, you know, obviously death that's happening right now. But I, I think, uh, I think th let me put it this way. I think at the end of the Gaza conflict will be the best chance this century to have a new Middle East where Arabs, Muslims, Jews, everyone can yep. live together peacefully. I'm, it won't be that easy, but I think it is going to succeed. Quick hitter from a member. Uh, Tony M, shout out to you for being a channel member. Great question. Great question, which we haven't talked about. And uh, I feel ashamed, but it's a good way to end the interview. Uh, the debate, the debate in the United States right now, Israel and Ukraine, just Israel. Why do we need Ukraine? It's, and Putin was hammering that. It's like, you want the war to end? Stop funding Ukraine, which yeah. was an obvious manipulation. So, so great way to end the interview with that question. Great question, Tony. Yeah, great question. Uh, I recommend also checking out the Maria report. We we I'm I'm off on a co great spaces space. They talk about this all day long, every day, and they're on 24/7, 365. So when you're not watching Tom, check out the Hidden History Happy yeah. Hour and the Maria report. No. Uh, look, uh, as of today, the United States has spent something less than seven percent of our de our defense budget with military assistance to Ukraine. What have we gotten in return? One, most importantly, morally, we've supported a people and a country who were genocidally invaded with no justification, regardless of Putin's 27 minutes on the 800 year history. They've fought more courageously, more creatively with technologies like Palantir and others, more successfully than anyone would have ever imagined them. They're still in the fight. They probably would be decisively winning the fight right now. And this is where I will criticize the Biden administration. I think, you know, America and Europe's support for Ukraine has been pretty superb and amazing, but it's been too slow. Every weapon system that that Zelensky needs, the U.S. has a history of not giving it, not giving it, not giving it, and then all of a sudden giving it, but so late that it would have done a lot of good elsewhere. So what we've got in return, in addition to the moral value of supporting uh, movements of, of freedom from invasion is we've degraded the combat capability of the Russian military, at least based on the experts I follow, 50 to 60 to 70 percent. And we've proven to the world, including to the Chinese, if we stay the course in Ukraine, that this is not we're not in post history. You don't just get to invade other countries for your own bloodthirsty reasons and keep them. And that's what I think the value is. I, I am appalled. You re, read my feed, you'll see it. Every day I go after the, it's not even the Congress. It's about 15 to 20 far right MAGA members of conference, including the Speaker of the House, who I like to call now Moscow Mike Johnson, hashtag that, um, and, and, and former President Trump, who are trying to block this aid. I think it's a huge mistake. And I think... I would say I'll go give it 60, 40 right now that the good guys will win. Meaning, uh, unfortunately, the Speaker of the House sent everybody on vacation for two weeks, which is horrible. But when they come back, there is a maneuver in the U.S. House of Representatives called a discharge petition, where a majority of the House, regardless of whose party is in control, 
can vote to put a piece of legislation on the floor of the House for a vote, whether Moscow Mike Johnson wants it to happen or not. I think that will happen when they come back, and I think it will overwhelmingly be voted in. And I think Ukraine will get their F-16s, they'll get their artillery, they'll get other capabilities. And I still believe that uh, Ukraine will defeat Russia in this war and be free. And I think they need to. You're on mute. Yes, yes, I realized that. Uh, on time, actually. It's not, not, not bad enough. So we just hit the 90-minute mark, which is the perfect time to end the interview. Uh, I, not too much, not too little, but just enough to keep people wanting for more. And if they'll ask, I'll bring you back again. Obviously, I'd love to have you back. I'm just yeah, saying. yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Still 400 people. Nobody left. Still 400 nice. people in the chat, which is beautiful. Thank you for Tony for the great questions, for all the great questions from the audience. And of course, thank you for you, uh, uh, Brian. I really appreciate it. Uh, here's something little for you, Mike Jones. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. You know what, Tom? Next time we'll talk about the deep state. I have a lot to say yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to leave you with that. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, we'll see you in the next time. Thanks. See you next Peace. time.